when electricity was introduced into the farm cottage where my great-grandmother lived, and the very first light switch was flicked on, amidst the hum of the electricity and the glow of the new lights, she looked up and she said, it will kill us all. <laughs> now, fear in the face of new technology is understandable, especially when the impact is so wide and dramatic. And certainly, if my great-grandmother had been talking about artificial intelligence, AI, she would have been in esteemed company. It's well known the technologist and inventor Elon Musk and the late physics professor Stephen Hawking both assessed AI to constitute a major threat to our future on the Earth. There's a fear that one day, sentient, intelligent, autonomous robots will seek to dominate and replace us with our own inventions, such as depicted in scenarios in films like The Terminator or The Matrix, or that an appropriately configured computer system will become effectively equivalent to a human mind, as seen in films like iRobot and Stanley Kubrick's masterwork, 2001, A Space Odyssey, where the onboard computer HAL refused to comply with a request from the astronaut Dave when HAL perceived it to jeopardize their space mission. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's behind this fear? And is it justified? Well, I'll tell you what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid not so much that the technology has limits, although I think it has. I'm afraid that we're in danger of lowering our regard for and expectations of the human mind to meet the technology. Because although AI systems perform very efficiently, tasks that human minds sometimes perform, there is a tendency to think that maybe these two things could be interchangeable. But this is unwarranted, because they're two entirely different things. Certainly, what a lot of AI systems do is very impressive. And the quirks of some of those systems are worth commenting on. There was one particular system that was able to distinguish pictures of wolves from pictures of dogs. And in this particular implementation, what the computer got used to doing was looking at the background. And if the computer detected snow in the background, it concluded that the picture was of a wolf. <laughs> now, even if the criteria the computer used was more wolfy, um, the computer is still only performing a kind of a mechanical task and dealing with abstract things. And um, while software has no moving parts, nevertheless, it constitutes a series of instructions. And instructions can be conflicting, inconsistent, or incomplete. And we all know the results of this. Um, computers get stuck. They produce the wrong output. They become unresponsive. They generally drive us mad from time to time. And those of you who have wrestled with the infamous Microsoft Windows blue screen of death or the interminably spinning coloredy beach ball from Apple Mac will know what I'm talking about. Or maybe you got stuck at the automated checkout in the supermarket where you're told reassuringly in the dulcet tones of the computer system that help is coming. <laughs> Risks of this sort of thing happening are so everyday that the programmer Bruce Eckel made famous the aphorism, if it's not tested, it's broken. And in complex, more integrated systems, you can't test everything. So it's almost inevitable that something will fail somewhere, somehow. And in computability theory, there is no general way of guaranteeing that a computer program will come to a stop and produce an output and not go into an indefinite spin. It's called uh, Turing's halting problem. But it's even worse than that. In the early 1950s, it was proved that we cannot ensure that a certain behavior of interest will manifest prior to running a program against some input. We just have to run it and, and find out. It's actually one of the reasons why you have to click accept when you install computer software on your machine. And recent research in the area of machine learning by a collaborative effort involving groups at the University of Waterloo in Canada and the Institu Israel Institute of Technology and other institutions, they have shown that there is a limit to how much a computer can learn in respect to performing a certain task. And the reasons for this are interesting. Computers like to deal with discrete numbers or whole numbers like one, two, and three. But real-world data is not like that. Real-world data has lots of digits behind the decimal point that go on and on and on and on and trailing off into the distance. And those 
this digits at the very end might be very significant. And because it's actually unknowable whether the chasm between these two systems of numbers can be bridged, that we have this problem of learnability. Now, you may say to yourself, what if the technology gets better? What if we start building computers out of different things in different ways? Well, the kind of hard limitations I'm talking about are not at the level of technology. They're not even at the level of mathematics. They're at the level of the foundations of mathematics. And at the heart of those foundations, there is a paradox. And the paradox looks like this. This statement cannot be proved. Now, in mathematics, you have to categorize everything into a set, true or false, at least. If we take a statement like that, and we say we put it into the false bucket, well, what's it saying? It's saying this statement can be proved. If it's false, it must be saying this statement can be proved. But if it can be proved, it must be true, because you can only prove things that are true. So if it's false, it's true. And that's a contradiction, <laughs> which we cannot allow. So for consistency, we must accept it, that there are things that are true, that cannot be proven, and that means that there are things beyond the scope of mathematics that we have to take as true, that cannot be proved. This uh, forms part of what's known as Gödel's incompleteness theorems, named after the Austrian mathematician Kurt Gödel. Or, as William Shakespeare wrote it centuries before, in the voice of the character of Hamlet, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Basically, uh, the bard stated in the language of literature what Kurt Gödel proved in the language of mathematics. Now, mathematics is highly exact and certain, but it pertains to truths about quantity, number, and structure. And these have a certain uh, scope. But higher, bigger picture truths are accessible, thankfully, to other areas of inquiry. But for computers, it's the only game in town. And for those of us studying an area of natural science, like physics in my case, our niche becomes the only game in town. Because physics, um, anthropology, biology, computers, and other areas, I think they've become, become unmoored from their common substrate in the ever uh, more demanding and specialized worlds of academic and um, our commercial environments. There's a sense in which our domain of knowledge can become fragmented and we lose sight of the bigger picture, and we can succumb to um, fears around AI, for example. And none of these disciplines are self-sufficient. I mean, even in physics, um, it, we have presuppositions. For example, what we measure today under one set of conditions, we expect to get the same result tomorrow when measured under, under the same set of conditions. Or that we even have justification to proceed with the expectation that what we measure in reality will actually be rationally intelligible. These are assumptions, presuppositions, that we have to take on board prior to embarking upon exploration. And sound philosophy is what unites them, these disciplines, and what should unite them. And it needn't be necessarily um, abstract or esoteric. Philosophy is the love of truth. And um, it should also comport with our everyday experiences, like that uh, we have will and freedom of will. A computer has neither of these two things. A computer is, is very simple, and we can do things like decide between two equal claims in our attention, like when our uncle came to us with two fists outstretched like this, asking us to pick one, a, a, coin, a coin being hidden in one of them. We were able to do that. And in my own line of work today, uh, in software development, we have to intervene from time to time to resolve a conflict, like when two programmers modify the same line of code, or when there's a, some kind of deadlock. But a computer cannot deal with two independent, equal, simultaneous claims on its attention. It just looks at the two of them and can't decide between them and says, I give up, I don't know. <laughs> and going deeper still, it would undermine the scientific method to expect physical matter or anything built on physical matter to have this freedom as well. An electron cannot but go into a spiral motion when in, inside a magnetic field. But we can refuse to answer a question by exercising our freedom of will. And electrical states in the brain are not causes of this, I don't think, in the final sense. They're more like effects. All of this suggests that we have a dimension to our minds that is slightly above the natural order, that we can uh, contemplate it, that we have a certain dominion over it. And this is also true in respect of what things signify. Inside a computer, there are loads of ones and zeros flying around. The computer has no clue what these ones and zeros represent. Uh, you might read the bits 101. That might represent three indicators, true, false, true, one, zero, one. Or it might represent the number five. This is called metadata. 
the data that describes what the data means and what it signifies. But to a computer, it's all just data. It makes no distinction. And in a way, if to understand what data signifies, you need metadata, so too, to understand what physical things signify, you need something beyond and in addition to uh, physical matter. That's what meta means, sort of beyond. Um, and that makes some sense coming from the point of view of physics because, um, well, the laws of gravity and the equations of electromagnetism are not anywhere to be found in nature. It takes a supervening intellect to infer them or impose them. And while our thoughts involve physical states in the brain to do with electrons and ions, they're not reducible to them because they lack what philosophers call intentionality or aboutness. The electrical states in my brain are not about what I'm thinking about if I'm thinking about a tree. And um, they're not true or false either in the way that our thoughts can be true or false. And intention is very important because intention forms the basis by which we consider others, know others, care about them. When I was in secondary school, we had a computer called Philip. And Philip was a notoriously unreliable computer, frequently going into an unresponsive hang. And we would laugh and jeer at Philip, say, oh, Philip, you've gone and done it again. <laughs> but the computer never felt embarrassed, never experienced any sense of shame. I mean, after we rebooted him, obviously. <laughs> and the, the serious point here, there's no distinction uh, between what a computer does and what a computer should do. It just does whatever it does, uh, like any good machine. And what kind of a machine is it really? Well, it's really just an automated abacus. AA, not AI. Complexity doesn't change what a thing essentially is. It just adds to it quantitatively, not qualitatively. We have a sense of value. We have a sense of our own value. We can say to ourselves, I'm in this state. I should be in this better state. And even if one day a band of artificially intelligent robots decided to eradicate mankind, that would come from some sort of a value judgment that would have to be explicitly programmed into it, presumably by some evil genius. What lurks beneath, I think, a lot of the fears around AI is the harmful and false and bad and wrong philosophy that man is a kind of a biological computer. But our dignity lies above that. We are not objects of science, ultimately, or of technology. We are subjects. We can say I and truly mean it. Finally, a computer can only take in symbols we give it and rearrange them according to rules that we give it. It cannot really come up with anything new. What I'm trying to say is a computer cannot be inspired the way that we can be inspired. We see this in great writings, great works of art. That's why they have a certain quality to them that resonates with us deeply, that channels our emotions, that illuminates our intellects. And when we, uh, we seek inspiration when we're trying to give talks too, and some talks do inspire. I hope this was one of them. Thank you. <laughs>